Good morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. My name is Michael Zare, and I'm from Key West, Florida. You know, I was thinking a little bit about what you said, Todd, and um, I'm thankful to be here this weekend. To see so many people that I love and care about and who've had such an influence on my life. And at the same time, I'm also thankful to get the opportunity to share the word of the Lord with you this morning. Now that the combination of those two things can become kind of an interesting thing for me. I, um, I've got friends and classmates who have promised me that they're going to heckle me from the, state, or from the audience this morning. And um, uh, while I thought about that for a moment, then I told them that if they decided to heckle me, that would just distract me and I would preach longer. So I think I deterred them. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen anymore. My time at Heston College as a student helped define not only who I became, but also helped define who I did not become while I was here. They were two of the most important years of my life. Yes, that's me in 1977. Um, I had a lot more hair then, and um, I was probably a lot more full of myself too. Some of the closest relationships that I have today began in those years uh, at Heston College. And Heston has impacted both my life and the lives of my daughters as they came here to be students. I'm now a church planter. It might be more accurate to say I'm a missionary in Key West. In the summer of 2010, my friend Jeff Smith, who uh, is a Heston graduate, by the way, and his family had taken a trip to Florida. And while they were on the wharf in Key West, God spoke to Jeff. God said to Jeff, I can do my work here, Jeff. Now, Jeff wasn't immediately certain what to make of this message from God, and he kept it to himself for a while, but eventually he had to share it with his wife, Kathy, who, by the way, is also a Heston graduate. And they began to pray. They began to pray about what God was saying to them. Now, Jeff and I had been accountability partners for many years at that point. And in the February of 2011, Jeff shared that message with me, that God was saying he could do his work in Key West. And then I went on to share it with my wife, Rebecca, and the four of us began to meet. We began to talk, we began to pray, we began to share with other persons and discern with them. And it was the beginning of something very new that God was doing in the lives of our two families. As we heard in the scripture today in Isaiah, God indeed is doing new things. Now on the surface, you know, it sounds good, right? It sounds good. Let's, God's doing new things. That sounds fun. That sounds exciting. But let's be honest. Most of us aren't, don't really want God to do anything new. We'd rather God just kept on doing exactly what God was doing because then we can continue to do exactly what we're doing as well. I actually spent a good portion of my life thinking that God really didn't do much at all. And I thought that the work of God was only done if we did it. I mean, isn't that really what we say? We talk, about, we talk about ourselves as being God's hands and feet. And by the way, I challenge you to find that exactly in Scripture. We talk about that, and, and we talk about it in a way of saying, you know, if we don't get God's work done, it won't get done. And, and the implication is that God really isn't doing much of anything at all. So what about this idea that God is doing something new? Will God indeed do new things if we, his people, don't initiate them? Let's listen again to the words of Isaiah 43, 19. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. So God is reminding his people in this 
uh, passage of scripture in Isaiah that he brought them out of Egypt. And, and of course, that was an amazing mark in time for those folks in their relationship with God. God had done something amazing for them. And then in verse 18, as God is coming up to verse 19 here where he talks about doing something new, let's listen to what he says here. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. God says, you, you, you know what I did in the past? Bringing you out of Egypt, parting the Red Sea? That was no big deal at all. You wait to see what I'm about to do. You wait to see what I'm going to be up to next. Is that true for us? Is it true that God is doing things that are new? Instead of trying to create God's work, are we supposed to figure out what God is doing and try to join God in that effort? You know, part of the problem is that trying to create God's work for him allows us to do what we're comfortable with. Let's, let's take our prayers, for example. If God isn't actively doing anything new or different, then we can simply continue to ask God to bless what it is we're doing. And we never have to attempt anything that's bigger than our own resources or our own limitations. But if God is already at work in people's lives and in situations, then we would have to spend significant prayer time seeking God, listening for what God's doing, and expecting that God's going to be busy doing God-sized things. I think I'm going to repeat that for you. If God is already at work, then we have to spend significant prayer time seeking God, listening for what God is doing, and expecting that God will be busy doing God-sized things instead of Mike-sized things. Let's look at Isaiah 43, 19 again to see where God is going to be doing this new work. For I am about to do something new. I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. So it appears that God's going to do these new things in the wilderness and in the dry wasteland. Cool. Are you ready to go with God to those places? Are you excited about that? God's inviting you to help make change. It looks to me like God wants to change the wilderness. He wants to change the dry wasteland. And that seems like a good thing until I discover that if I'm going to join God in that work, then I need to join him in the wilderness and the dry wasteland. In the summer of 2013, the Smith family and the Zare family moved to Key West, Florida. God had taken Jeff and Kathy and their family on a one-year side trip from Ohio to Washington State to help a new church get started there. And so they put all their stuff in a moving truck and they began the trek from Washington State to Key West. I don't think in the continental United States you could take a longer trip than from Washington to Key West, Florida. My wife Rebecca and I, on the other hand, dropped our youngest daughter Taylor off here in Heston, Kansas for college, and we told her to come find us at Christmas. We had just sold our home in Ohio, and the, the Smith home didn't sell until later that fall, but it did eventually sell. There were no jobs arranged in Key West, because people in Key West don't hire you if you don't have a Key West address. You see, people from all over the world come to Key West, and they always ask about jobs and so on, and the people in Key West know that those folks, most of them aren't really going to come to Key West. And so unless you have a Key West address, you can't get a job. So there were no jobs for us when we arrived. Jeff and Kathy had, uh, actually that's not true, Rebecca and Kathy had gone into Key West the summer before and had found a place for Jeff and Kathy to live, but did not find a place for us to live. And then 
as Rebecca and I got on the road, we were on the way to Key West. Our stuff had been shipped already. It was on the way. And Jeff and Kathy found a place for us to live, so we were glad to know that we had a place to live when we arrived. Now, the combined rent for these two apartments in Key West was about $4,300 a month. We had moved to an island, but it sure felt like a dry wasteland early on. No jobs and very expensive places to live. But it was where God had invited us to join him in what he was doing. And so we went. Now, God never promises us that we'll get to be comfortable. I've I've never seen anywhere in the Scripture, and particularly where Jesus talks to someone, I never saw anywhere where Jesus invited people to be comfortable. Being comfortable is a standard that our culture holds up as the most important thing. We need to be comfortable with where we live. We need to be comfortable with how we look. And of course, we need to buy all these products and so on to make sure that we can continue to be comfortable. There was a, uh, there was a commercial quite a number of years ago. There was a gentleman and he was mowing his lawn and he had a beautiful home and he was telling about all these things. He says, I have a beautiful home. I have this beautiful yard. I belong to the country club and I play golf. And, and um, he said, there's only one problem. He says, I'm in debt up to my eyeballs, you know? And he says, what am I going to do about this? And it's true. We often spend a lot of our time and our resources making sure that we're comfortable, and then we continue to pay the price for those choices later. Being part of the new thing that God's doing is what we as followers of Jesus are supposed to be all about. I was thinking about the Heston College tagline, Start here, go everywhere. I think it fits really well with this Isaiah 42, 19 scripture. This idea of getting involved in what God is doing. Start here, go everywhere. It also reminds me of the words of the scripture we read in Matthew this morning. Let's listen again to Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and told his disciples... I have been given complete authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Every time that I read... The Great Commission. By the way, I think it's interesting that we call it the Great Commission. It's not the Great Suggestion. It's the Great Commission. It's what Jesus calls us to do. And every time I see that word go, it keeps poking at me. It keeps poking at me. Let let me give you an example. Dallas, where are you? Dallas Stutzman, where? There he is. He's right here. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick example. Is Dallas? Go. Yeah, go, Dallas. Go. Awesome, good, Dallas. You can come back now. (laughs) Appreciate that. You see, the problem with the word go is that you can't just continue to do what you're doing and go. It doesn't work that way. When you see the word go, you've got to do something about it. And go means change. I believe that go is the toughest part of the Great Commission to fulfill because indeed it does mean change and change is often difficult. Sometimes when I preach, and now I'm not going to do it this morning because some of you are, a lot of you are guests here and, and so on, but sometimes when I preach in a congregation and I want to give them an example of how difficult change can be, I'll ask them all to stand up and then I'll ask them all to go sit somewhere else. Okay? I tell them they all have to go move at least two benches away. Now, I'm going to ask you to be honest with me this morning. How many of you generally sit in the same area in the same place every Sunday morning? Yeah, that's what I figured. And it's amazing to me, it's absolutely amazing to me, how difficult it is for people to make a small change like go sit in a different place in their own church sanctuary. But change is tough. 
Change is difficult. And change can be hard even in the small things. Let me show you a favorite cartoon of mine. I, I assume this looks familiar to most of you. Some of you who are younger may not recognize it. But for those of you who need some explanation, in this Peanuts comic strip, Lucy would often hold the football for Charlie Brown to kick. And Charlie Brown would approach the ball, and he'd kick with all his might, and Lucy, of course, would pick up the ball, and Charlie Brown would fall flat on his back. One particular version of this comic strip opened with Lucy holding the ball, but Charlie Brown refusing to kick it. Lucy begged him, but Charlie Brown said, hey, every time I kick the ball, you remove it, and, and I fall flat on my back. They went back and forth for the longest time, and finally Lucy broke down in tears, and she admitted, Charlie Brown, I have been so terrible to you over the years, picking up the football like I have. I have played so many cruel tricks on you, but I've seen the error of my ways. I've seen the hurt look in your eyes when I've deceived you. I've been wrong, so wrong. Won't you give a poor penitent girl another chance? Charlie Brown was moved. And he responded, of course I'll give you another chance. He stepped back as she held the ball and he ran. And at the last moment, Lucy picked up the ball and Charlie Brown fell fat, flat on his back. Lucy's last words were this, recognizing your faults and actually changing your ways are two different things, Charlie Brown. <laughs> Do we see ourselves in the comic strip at all? You know, isn't it easy for us to recognize the need for change or the call to change, but never do anything about it? Go requires change. In these verses in Matthew 28, Jesus is clearly calling each one of us to go. When people found out that we were going to Key West to do ministry, uh, they would often say, wow, well, Mike, it must be nice for God to call you to a tropical island in your 50s. And I would respond, yeah, come join us. There's a lot that God has to do in Key West. Come and join us. And the responses that I often got from people reminded me of the parable in Luke 14 where people are invited to the great banquet. They would say things to me like, we just bought another house. We can't move right now. A little bit like I just bought a field and I must go and see it. Or they would say, Mike, I have my business to take care of. Or they would say, Mike, my children and my grandchildren are all here. They need me. One of the things that I didn't anticipate when we moved to Key West was the response of my daughters. I was afraid that they would be um, upset that we were leaving the house they'd grown up in and we were, they wouldn't be able to come home at Christmas time to the community where their friends were. But instead, to my amazement, my two daughters were so excited. They were so thrilled that their parents were following God's call and were willing to go. And that encouraged us as we went because it wasn't, it hasn't been always easy and, and uh, especially early on, uh, it was difficult. Now I know that God has not called each one of you to come to Key West with us, but I know God has called each one of us to go to get involved in the new things that God is doing. And I don't pretend that I know everything that go is going to involve for each one of you, but I do know where go begins. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 21 to 23. Since you have heard all about him and have learned the truth that is in Jesus, throw off your old evil nature and your former way of life which is rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. Instead, there must be a spiritual renewal of your thoughts and attitudes. You see, if we aren't in the process of dying to ourselves, 
if we aren't in the process of dying to our selfishness and being recreated in God's image, then we're never going to get to the go of the Great Commission. I encourage us to listen to the way we talk to each other. Phrases like, I want, and I need, and I like, they often reveal our true priorities. They tell us where our allegiances lie with our own desires. The same is true for me. Yet, at the very heart of the gospel message is that we die to our own desires so that we can become more like God. And the go, the go of the Great Commission moves us toward God's desires. It calls us to make a sacrifice of our own desires for the benefit of God and the benefit of others. It calls us to see others as God sees them. Seeing what people could become in a relationship with Jesus. When we first moved to Key West, my wife and I lived in a townhouse. And our next door neighbor was a man, we'll call him John. John is an alcoholic. Um, when John, well, John would show up at our house if, if we had a, a cook at or something. Um, John would show up at our house drunk and, and participate in our cookouts, which was fine. But when John was drunk and nobody else was around, he would often talk about suicide. And we'd sit and listen. When John got really frustrated with himself, he'd take a knife and cut himself on the stomach. Listening to John, caring for John, loving John, takes a lot of time and energy. Eventually, we began to invite John to our gatherings at Christmas and Thanksgiving and at other holidays because John didn't have friends or family to spend time with. John needed to know that somebody cared about him. And part of the go in all of our lives is to make room for people like John who need us desperately. One of the places where I spend a significant period of, or a significant amount of my time these days um, is I run sound for bands in Key West. There's a lot of live music in Key West. And I run sound for these bands, and most of that time is spent in bars. Now, if you would have told me 10 years ago I was going to spend most of my time in bars, I would have told you you were crazy. But you know what? It was where God was doing a new thing. Actually, it was where God was continuing to do what he'd always been doing, but he just wanted me to join him. Sometimes when I'm in the bar, I find the lyrics that the bands play kind of offensive. And certainly, I find the things that people do in the bars that I hang out in um, to be sometimes, I don't know, I guess upsetting. But I keep asking Jesus to show me these people as he sees them, to give me eyes to see them as he sees them. And I'm learning about how much God loves those people. You know, like the father in the prodigal son story, I'm learning how much God longs to wrap his arms around the folks in the bars and, and to love them and, and to restore his relationship with them. And I'm finding plenty of opportunities to minister to people in that setting. And I'm learning to care enough about them to overcome my own discomfort. See, if we make our decisions based on what we like or what we're comfortable with, we'll never get to the go of the Great Commission. I I bet this is true for most of you, you who, who are regular churchgoers. You, you go and you sit in, a, in a, say, some kind of a committee meeting, a part of a church group you're a part of that gets together to, to dream together and to make decisions together. And when you get to the end of the conversation, the person who's in charge wants to make sure that you're all on the same page. So they ask you this question. Are y'all comfortable with that? Jesus would never ask you that question. 
Jesus might ask you if you were willing. But if we're only willing to do what we're comfortable with, we're never going to get very far. So, it's time to go. It's time to go. How will that go begin for you today? Every new journey has a starting point. Maybe it means go across the room. Maybe it means go across the street. What does it mean? What does go mean for you? One of the places I want to encourage you to begin to work at the go is in the way that you pray. When this started to happen for me, my daughters were both in school, in our local school system. And I remember them leaving in the morning for school and um, me praying things like, uh, God, uh, help them to have a good day. Um, pray that things will go well for them, that they'll be happy and content. And then I realized that I had to begin to pray. The go required me to learn to pray for so much more than that. And so I began to say things like, God, let them be blessings to their teachers. God, let them be a good influence on their friends. I call those kingdom prayers. The kingdom prayers are about to go. I didn't stop praying that they'd have a good day or that, or that they'd uh, do well, but I started realizing that their lives were about so much more than that. Learning to pray the go is learning to pray kingdom prayers. I, um, I remember when my girls were in school, I'd, they'd uh, be coming home for breaks and stuff, and that was it, you know, it was a 15-hour trip home, and I would pray for their safety and so on, and then I realized I had to begin to pray for so much more than that. So I began praying that, that God would open their eyes to please people that they could bless along the way on the trip, and that uh, God would open their eyes to people they might minister to or help out who were in distress. Listen for what you're praying about this week. That's your assignment. Todd got to give the kids an assignment. I'm going to give you one. Listen for what you're praying about this week. Listen for how often your prayers are about your comfort or the comfort of someone you love. And start to think about how you can pray go. How you can pray the go and share with others. How you can pray ministry upon others. Remember that comfort is the standard of the world, and it is not the comfort or the standard of followers of Jesus. And begin to ask God to involve you in the new things he's going to do, even if it makes you uncomfortable. God is doing something new. God is already at work in this new thing, and God wants you to join him. Are you ready to go? Start here. Go everywhere. Let's pray. Lord, you are indeed asking us to join you in the new things that you're doing, to go where it is you're going and to be a part of that. Lord, soften our hearts and open our eyes and our minds to what it is you're about. Remind us, God, that when the Pharisees told Jesus to tell the people to be quiet, he said, if the people are quiet, the rocks will cry out. God, it isn't that you need us to do your work. It's that you want us to join you, like any good parent, in what it is you're doing. Show us where the beginning of the go is for us today. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.